So I'm, I'm Sherry Kohlberg. I'm a professor of exercise science at uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. I live in Virginia Beach. I'm also an ad adjunct professor at um, Eastern Virginia Medical School in internal medicine. So most of the stuff that I do, yeah, obviously I'm trained as an exercise physiologist and my early training was in uh, exercise metabolism, like turnover of glucose and fatty acids and that sort of stuff. But um, my interest has really been in looking at specifically at, at diabetes and exercise. And so I've kind of carved a niche for myself in that, that area. Um, I've done stuff in both type 1 and type 2. So I'm, I mean, I know I'm mainly talking about type 1 today, but if you have questions about type 2, I can do that as well. And um, so I guess I'll go, go ahead and get started. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about get, uh, um, how to prevent uh, blood glucose changes. I, I, I can also answer questions about hyperglycemia, but I was going to focus more on what we're more concerned about, which is um, developing lows. So not all of you have been around as quite as long as I have, but I remember when there weren't very many athletes with type 1 diabetes. In fact, um, I have a book out that's called Diabetic Athlete's Handbook, and there was an earlier version of that book that was just called The Diabetic Athlete that came out in 2001. And when I was putting together that book, there were you know just a handful of athletes with type 1. I had to really look far and, and wide to find them. Um, like a, you know, a guy who was a hockey player for Philadelphia, Bobby Clark, and some others, a um, couple of a tennis player, and you know, th but they were hit and miss to find them. And um, it's actually been very gratifying for me to see in the last decade all of these athletes come out, like they were talking about this morning. Um, you guys can move my stuff if you want my chair. I don't mind. So there are all these athletes that just kind of have come out of the woodworks in the meantime. And also, th there's been a lot more research in. I'm sorry, I think your mic is working. It's not, or it is. Do you have this one turned on? Okay, well, I'll just try to stay here and talk in this then. But that one may just be for the video camera in the back there. Uh, so you might recognize some of these people uh, are at the conference today, actually. In the corner down there, Bill King, the Foy. <laughs> I saw Gary Hall Jr. last week in um, Santa Barbara. Um, support cars was a ballerina, New York City ballet. Uh, so all these people have just um, been able to excel in sports, which is I've found to be really, really gratifying because when I first started looking into it, there were, like I said, there were very few. So there are a couple of things that. Um, are really apparent in terms of doing really well if you have diabetes. In order to succeed, do you want to optimize your performance? How are you going to do that? You're going to make sure that you have enough fuel for your body to use during exercise. That means you actually have to be smarter than the average athlete um, because you have to understand what is going on in your body. They just like, oh, you know, someone tells them you fuel with this, you fuel with that. They're like, okay, but you have to know why that is and make adjustments. Um, and also you want to be able to prevent hypoglycemia because that is probably the biggest cause of poor performance of anything. I mean, I know some of you probably experienced having hyperglycemia and that made you feel crappy or slow or whatever, but if you get hypoglycemia, you usually have to stop and you just can't continue what you're doing. So uh, this is sort of anecdotal. I don't have the, uh, the exact data like uh, Dr. Jendel did, but this, um, over the years, athletes have told me that they are usually performing best if they're in a fairly normal <laughs> range. We're deforming, uh, uh, defining normal kind of liberally here, but you know, up to about 180. And then some people will start a little bit lower if they know that they're going to be doing an event that's going to cause a huge increase. So, you know, just to give an example, um, I've heard Gary Hall say this a couple of times, but he was uh, at a forum last week and said again that when he would get in to do his 50 meter freestyle race in the Olympics, he'd try to start out around <coughs> 140, you know, so he's in that range there. And when he got done, he'd be like 388. And it only took him 21 seconds to do the event. So you're like, wow, it affects adrenaline and, uh, you know, a little <laughs> pre-competition jitters and everything else. But 
Um, so if he started at 50, he'd probably be fine at the end, whereas the rest of us doing other things wouldn't. So, and this is kind of what I was just getting at. Why are you going to avoid the low? I mean, sometimes the symptom you get when you're getting low is that all of a sudden you're just really fatigued. I know for myself, I'll start thinking, you know, I'm just so tired and I've got like a thousand yards left to swim. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Oh, I must be low. <laughs> you know, it's like it, my m I go through this mental process because all of a sudden I'm a lot more tired than I should be. It's not like you don't get tired exercising, but you just, it's sort of just abnormally tired. Um, with that loss of coordination, there, uh, there was an athlete that told me once that when he's running along, when he would start kicking the back of uh, his, his heel on one shoe with the toe of his other foot, then he knew he was getting low. So that was kind of a <laughs> lack of coordination thing. Uh, they have done some studies and looked at uh, whether you, how it affects strength and obviously endurance you can see, but also strength is lower because the most of the fuel you use for really short events is, is carbohydrate. So it's either glycogen or glucose. And again, that's gonna not get you where you wanna be. So, you know, I can tell you all the symptoms. You guys all know the symptoms, but what you may not know about the symptoms is they're not always the same, and they may be different during different activities, and they may be different after, um, during, depending on whether you've already had a low that day, <laughs> you know. So just don't ex expect that you're always gonna have the exact same um, symptoms every time. Uh, and also, you can get adrenaline released for other reasons. That, that's uh, a, what it causes a lot of these symptoms, not, not all of them, because we have two levels of hypoglycemia. One where we get the release of adrenaline and other hormones that it, we call adrenergic symptoms. And then we have ones where we have neuroglycopenic symptoms, where the nerves are actually in your brain are not getting enough glucose, and that's where you get some, they're a little bit more severe at that point. So some of these are from one and some are from the other, but you can get adrenaline release that makes you shaky if, um, say, you're going to do public speaking and you don't normally do it. That doesn't happen to me anymore. But uh, or if you say you're going to do your race and it's pre-competition, or uh, you're just stressed for some other reason, and um, I also get adrenergic system symptoms if I eat celery because I'm really really allergic to it, and I've been at restaurants before going. Did I just eat some celery or am I low? You know, because the, it's the same initial symptoms. Um, so it can be confused sometimes with other things. That's why you always need to test your meter anyway. So just a little exercise physiology. <laughs> I'm an exercise physiologist, so I get to throw this stuff in there. Um, but th this morning we uh, mentioned the GLUT4 glucose transport proteins. And probably the most important thing to know about those is that they are recruited both by insulin and by contractions, and it's their separate and independent mechanisms. And apparently there are two different, I know this is a really complicated slide, but there are two different pools of these GLUT4 proteins in uh, muscle cells, and you can recruit them when insulin binds, and that's the main mechanism at rest, but you can also recruit them when your muscle contracts without the need for insulin. In fact, they've done uh, studies, and they, they've known this for decades, that you don't actually need any insulin at all when you're exercising. You can take up all the glucose you need into muscle cells without insulin. But what you need the insulin for is to kind of act as a check and balance on the release of glucose-raising hormones, because you have insulin that lowers, and then you have four other hormones that can raise glucose. And so it's a balance of those two. And so in, a, in a, an isolated muscle prep is where they first found this out. And they would take out a muscle fiber and they'd make it contract um, in a test tube. And they found that it didn't need any insulin at all. But then you talk about the whole body and there's some need for some insulin. Now, insulin levels usually are lower. That's one thing we'll talk about. But it's not like they're completely gone. So it's this, these, the fact that you have two mechanisms that actually take up glucose during exercise that can cause you to drop precipitously when you start exercising because you can't shut down the insulin necessarily if it's injected or pumped. <laughs> so what you're really trying to get at is the top situation, you glycemia, where everything stays perfectly normal. You, you start exercising at 100, you end up exercising, and you're still at 100. That's ideal, right? Um, <laughs> that's to me every once in a while. <laughs> Uh, yeah, not most of the time. 
Um, so you can have either of these situations. Hypoglycemia is actually probably the, uh, the leading cause of why adults with type 1 diabetes don't exercise because they're afraid of developing a low during the activity. And um, hyperglycemia is not going to happen as often unless you really are very insulin deficient. So for example, you um, forgot to take any insulin that day. And if you were to check your ketones, blood or urine, you would have moderate or higher levels. And then it's going to be really hard to have any kind of check and balance on the release of those glucose raising hormones. And in fact, they get, you have an exaggerated release of them and usually end up higher. But that's a different situation. So I, um, I was going to just mention a few steps, and uh, we'll talk a little bit in detail about some of these, and then um, some I'm going to leave to Jane. But uh, we do know that there are certain situations that are going to cause you m to be more likely to develop hypoglycemia. One is anytime you're doing a new or unaccustomed exercise, because there really is a training effect in terms of fuel use and the balance of carbs and fat and that you're able to use during an activity. And when it's a new one, you're actually more dependent on carbohydrate and glucose. And so doing a new activity, yeah, it might drop more. Uh, also, just in um, you know, longer duration. Or if you're ever exercising when your insulin levels are high, and that may be because you just gave some insulin or it's during a peak time for other reasons, or you've been stacking trying to bring down a high and I, it hasn't all gotten taken out of your system yet. You guys want to move from the back? You can. Yeah, I don't care if you sit in the middle or you know stand up near the sides. Or they should have given us a bigger room for some of these. Um, so one thing you can do is when you know you're going to be exercising, you can try to plan ahead and you can reduce the amount of insulin uh, going into exercise during it and even afterwards and help prevent lows. Um, it does take a little prior planning. Now, obviously, exercise is not always. Um, plan sometimes it's spontaneous <laughs> and that's when you run into more problems and if you if you have a pump you can reduce it but not always en enough if you are in on injections only it gets really harder and then you have to you know compensate with carbohydrates <coughs> so that's point number three you increase carbohydrate oh, also food intake I mean everybody I, I know is, is so into carb counting I personally after 45 years with type 1 diabetes I don't carb count believe it or not but I, I know what I eat and I know myself <coughs> so well that actually the carbohydrates are pretty only a small part of what affects how much insulin I need. Um, because, and you can use this strategically too, the foods that you eat are not all metabolized at the same rate. Like your carbs are you know, within the first hour or two and it depends on whether it's a higher glycemic index carb or a lower one. I mean, a lot of the stuff I eat is low glycemic index just because I gravitated towards that because of the first 18 years I lived with diabetes without a gl blood glucose meter. And eating things like, you know, white bread made me feel crappy, so I just didn't eat it. Um, so if I would give insulin for those carbs, and especially if I would take it before I eat, I would drop and get low before the food got metabolized. So, I mean, there are a lot of things to factor in. But you know, protein actually usually takes three to four hours to fully um, metabolize, and you can use that to prevent a low later on. Uh, and fat, although it doesn't directly usually get turned into glucose, it does promote insulin resistance by the time it all gets um, metabolized, and that helps prevent lows, but also can cause rises after your insulin has run out. And then uh, <laughs> the thing about exercise is you don't always just get low during it or right after it. it can it during that 48 hours up, up to 48 hours when you're replacing the uh, carbohydrate stores of muscle, the glycogen, uh, you can get low at any time. So sometimes people like shades and then they get low the next day during the day. It's still related to that last bout. So I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to give you some ideas of, of some ways to adjust some of these. So the, I think what I think about the most is how much insulin do I have on board when I'm exercising? Because that's going to really affect my, for, for you know, a normal amount of exercise, let's say an hour or less, it's really going to affect whether I drop or don't drop. Now, if I'm doing two or three hours, then it depends on the, uh, the intensity of the exercise and when I last ate. And you know, sometimes you want to refuel during that activity, and the amount of insulin you need then could be a little bit different. But in general, 
you're going to want to lower the amount of insulin that's circulating because that was what happens in a person who doesn't have diabetes. The insulin levels are reduced by the, the pancreas just lets out left, uh, lets releases left. And, um, and then it depends on which type of insulin you're talking about. Uh, usually we're saying you make an adjustment right before it, either with a, a shorter rapid acting insulin. If it's a pump, you only have the choice of reducing whatever's in the pump, which is usually a rapid acting insulin. But um, you can also then adjust basal rates and, and with um, using something like Lantus or Lovimir, you can adjust the doses of those either uh, bef going into an activity or at afterwards to try to compensate for your insulin levels. And generally, um, because when you're post-exercise, you're going to have lower levels of muscle glycogen, you're going to be more insulin sensitive. And so during that period of time, until you restore the glycogen, you're going to generally need less insulin to get the same job done. So you guys kind of know this. I just do this in here in case anybody wasn't aware of when these normally peak. Does anybody still use regular? I've only met a couple people that still do. I actually like regular because it covers the peaks and valleys of food better than, you know, rapid acting really just a, a is for higher GI carbs and it doesn't work well for the protein and the fat, but regular is a little bit more unpredictable because it hangs around a lot longer. Uh, the, the basal insulin, so they tell you there, there's no peak. Uh, Lantus definitely has some peaks. Um, and also the other thing about Lantus is that and I know this both from personal experience and from talking to some of the reps when it first came on the market. It, if you take smaller doses, it does not last 24 hours. And so um, I, years ago, I started, I'm, I'm still doing the poor man's pump right now. I, I'm on a pump vacation, <laughs> extended one. But anyway, the, um, so my Lantus, I actually split. And it's not evenly, but I do take it twice a day. And I know somebody actually takes it three times a day. So you know, if it's a, the smaller the dose, the less long it's going to last. When you say a smaller dose, does it mean like 24 hours? How small is it? Um, I think if, and I don't know, there's not really any uh, good data on this, but in my experience, if you use fewer than 20 units in a day, it's probably not going to last 24 hours for a basal. <coughs> yeah. Um, and a lot of athletes and exercising people don't take that much. And then when you split it, they're even smaller doses. <laughs> they last even shorter time. Um, so this is just a guideline. Uh, this is where one of the reasons why I had to write a whole book to address this topic, because it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. And all I can give you is general ideas. Um, duration has an effect. Intensity has an effect. Um, and then basically, also your starting blood glucose, which I have in another one. That, um, and these are not gospel amounts, but um, again, generally the longer you go, it's hard to do really super high intensity exercise for 180 minutes anyway. But if you did, you really wouldn't need that much insulin during the activity, although um, it depends on how much you want to refuel and that sort of thing. There are a few studies that have looked at the amounts, but just not enough. So. A lot of it I just came up with based on what's the body's usual response to a low, moderate intensity, you know, higher intensity stuff. So um, with uh, this, the right side is kind of doing an MDI, and the, the left side is that left and right for you. No, the other way. Um, in blue is for insulin pumps, and this is if you're doing just multiple daily injections. So generally, if you're doing lower intensity, I the decrease is going to be less. And then when it's more intense, um, especially if it's going to be longer, then it may be a little bit more. And then if you do it really long and you're refueling, you're going to actually, your insulin needs will start to rise over in during the second and third hour. Um, and then with a lot of people with the pump, they'll actually decrease the basal rate before they start to help lower those insulin levels. So maybe an hour or two before. And, and the amount they, they reduce it really varies based on the activity and the person and the normal doses and so forth. Uh, some people, if they take the pump off, they have to reconnect at least once an hour and give themselves uh, some of the basal that they missed during that hour. Because if you leave it off more than an hour and you're only on rapid acting insulin, after about two hours, you don't have any insulin left. And so um, 
I remember counseling this girl one time who was uh, just on a summer swim league, and those, I don't know if you guys know, been to those, but those swim meets last like five hours. Mm -hmm. She would take her pump off the whole time, and then she would wonder why she was like 350 at the end and not swimming very well. I'm like, uh, you know, just go in the bathroom, reconnect your pump once an hour, give yourself maybe half of your basil you missed during that hour. And then that worked, you know? So it's not even have to, that you have to replace all of it. It's just that you can't go for an extended period of time with no insulin because you have no basal. You have no backup with the pump. Um, you yeah. Uh, when that do you first? Yeah, you may not. Uh, you may not need to reduce the uh, insulin at all if it's going to be really short in time. So like the the Gary Hall example I told you, where he, it, you know, 21 seconds. So we're talking really short, really intense. And the, what might actually happen is because of the release of those glucose raising hormones, which are sort of released exponentially. Like if you do something low, there's a little bit of release, moderate here. You do intense, you get a huge release of them. Uh, you may have your glucose go up instead of down. So you may need all the <laughs> insulin at that point. <laughs> yeah. You talked earlier about the you know, three hours. What about the 10, 12 hours? Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Are you supposed to fall? I mean, that's where the, it gets real fuzzy. And right, and, and the problem is that when you go that long, you're, you're eating. You know, you just don't exercise for eight or ten hours without eating. And so you're going to need some insulin for that food generally, I even if it's just basal insulin that's covering it. So um, even athletes who are usually doing that amount of time can't go without any insulin just because of the um, fact that they have to eat. So. Yeah, and that's where I can't give a one pat, uh, you know, one answer fits all situation, as you guys know for that. Missy, what do you do when you're running for seven hours straight? Um, I rely on the um, very long insulin, like when it goes to the level of year. I actually, I never decrease my basal insulin. I eat up to it. Yeah, she likes to eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so here was a st um, one study that actually looked at trying to reduce uh, pre uh, pre insulin uh, pre exercise um, meal doses, and again they only did 30 or 60 minutes of exercise, and it was mild, moderate, or heavy, as you can see there. And you know it varied by the the duration and the intensity, both. That's the only state I know of that's like specifically looked at that. And, and they had a, a different regimen then to, uh, um, they might have even been using regular, I'm not even sure, but it just gives you a starting place and that's, that's about anyone, what anyone can give you. In fact, um, why I actually wrote this book in the first place and I had the earlier version in 2001 is because I went to a DESA meeting, which wasn't even DESA then, it was IDAA, uh, back in 1990 and that was, my first exposure to uh, a group of people who are active with type 1 diabetes and then I heard them in this one group there's like one person goes oh you know when I do this I reduce my insulin by this much and I eat this and, and then somebody else says something else and I'm like god wouldn't it be good to know all that stuff I mean uh, what if I go do an activity I haven't done before what do I do so the idea was to kind of benefit from everybody else's experience. But again, it's still going to be trial and error beyond that point because you have your own body, your own regimen, your own food preferences, you know, and everything is going to be a little bit unique. But it does give you at least an idea of where to start and what a usual response might be to a particular type and duration of activities. Uh, so, like I said, there's a, been a lot more research recently. Uh, I've been so excited to see that this one is even, uh, I, I looked before the conference again, and it still is just an EPUB. They haven't, it hasn't come out in print yet. But this one looked at um, lowering insulin. So what they did was for all of these different, um, uh, let me look at my picture again. Oh, you know, they were just trying, they all did the same exercise, and it was during that period from uh, 60 to zero there. They all just took 25% of their usual dose in the morning, and then what they were trying to look at is how much insulin do you need afterwards? Um, so when they had lunch, they did, they took either 50% or 75% or 100%. Yeah, keeping in mind that they'd already reduced their, their first meal um, down to 25%. And they found that actually, if you, that, that top line there, that 
dropping it still 50% for lunch after the activity prevented hypoglycemia better than if they took 75% or 100%. But later on, it, doing all of this, none of it necessarily prevented hypoglycemia at all. But so it was just within that time period that they were able to show that. But it does demonstrate that usually you do have to make some adjustments when you're going to exercise around when you're giving the short-acting insulins that you may have to reduce it before and then you may also have to reduce it for the next meal when you're still more insulin sensitive. All right, so switching from insulin and talking a little bit about um, carbohydrate, again, that, that really varies a lot. There are very few studies that have shown how much you need to consume. Um, there was a study that came out last year that was in non-athletes that looked at what's the total amount of, of um, ingested carbohydrate that your body can actually metabolize while you're doing an activity. And they, they had these guys doing uh, like two hours of pretty vigorous exercise and um, they found that it was around uh, 70 grams of carbs per hour was all that they could actually absorb from what they were consuming. So if you're taking in 140 grams in an hour, whatever, you know, based on a recommendation, you're just not even going to be able to absorb all that. So that's w when you get to the end of the exercise, people have often experienced that their glucose goes up at the end. But that's when you finish metabolizing the rest of these carbs that you couldn't um, digest fully and absorb fully while you were doing the activity. So again, I, I would um, kind of err on the side of maybe not over consuming the food unless you want to it, you know, it's all going to dump in your system right at the end, in which case you may need a little bit of insulin to cover some of that. So then how, sorry, that, that's my personal biggest struggle. Uh-huh. So then how do you eat up the carbs that you're not getting absorbed by the body? Because I like that you're not having to reduce the survival rate, but I feel like that's impacting that glycemic as well, but then if you're keeping your insulin at all the regular levels, then you're just relying on food to, as the food that you eat up to it, but then your body's not able to well, if you're just on basal, you know, consuming up to 70 grams per hour may actually be absorbable. I mean, that's what the, these athletes were able to absorb. And you may not need much more than that, depending on what you're doing. So it, it's, if, you've, if you haven't given any short-acting insulin and you're just on the basal, you figure, depending on your dose, you may only have a unit or two of insulin that becomes available every hour during that period of time. And you know what would you normally have to consume for a unit or two of insulin? And then there's a little bit of uptake, obviously, from the contractions as well. But you may be able to get by with less than you think that you need to take in during that period, especially if it's the first day of exercise, not a day when you're already glycogen depleted. So many factors to consider, huh? <laughs> I wish I had the answer to all these things. I just, you know, I can give you the uh, basis behind, you know, the recommendations, but I can't figure out exactly what's going to work for you on this particular day doing this particular activity. But I can give you an idea of what might work. So um, your pre-exercise blood glucose is also going to have a big effect on how much you may need to consume. Um, and obviously, when you're eating up to your insulin and your insulin levels are higher, then you're going to have to consume more. And the problem with trying to do that is sometimes you just your absorption doesn't keep up with the insulin. That I'll take you first, yeah, Johan. I think for for one has to distinguish between uh, short, medium, and long term exercise because you will you will utilize a lot less carb uh, for a long distance run or whatever. Right. And the main substrate of energy. So, so you cannot compare really uh, one, two hours with six, seven, ten hours. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I, I do have that in here a little bit longer, uh, farther on. It shows that the proportion of what you uh, consume, it varies with the activity and the duration. But you always do need some carbohydrate available. It depends. Do you, do you do another activity right after that? I mean, yeah, you, you, know, you said triathlon. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> a little while. I won't tell you. They just went to contact. I know this happens with a lot of people. They get out of the water and they're, they're sky high and maybe they have to reconnect the pump or, or do something. And then they start to bike and they immediately go into a hill and then they just keep going. No, they, they actually go higher. And then it takes them a long time to get back. It really depends on whether it's affecting your performance or not. If it's not, it's a short-term thing because as you continue to bike, you're going to use up some of that glucose. Um, so, it, it, yeah, again, it depends on how high you go from that and where you start out. But um, I, what you do have to remember is if you do give any insulin to bring that down, it's going to be way, way, way less than what you would normally need to bring it down. I mean, maybe a quarter if you're still exercising, um, maybe a half if you just got done exercising, you know, because otherwise, it, it, you know, there, there's a difference in how long the high lasts too, whether it's just caused by adrenaline or if it's caused by food intake or a combination of the two, because the food keeps getting metabolized. It didn't all get done in five minutes. I mean, it's like, so... It, it takes more insulin to bring that down if it's caused by food than if it's just caused by adrenaline release. What is the level you want to keep for it, like before you start exercising? It depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I, if you can aim to be somewhere in that, um, you know, like 80 to 180, and you. It is a big range. So uh, it's very dependent. I, I know Dr. Dunner would say it's lower than that, up to 144. But um, I've just had enough athletes tell me that they, you know, they're starting out swim practice. They actually want to be 220 at the beginning because they don't want to have to stop and eat every five minutes or they don't even want to have to eat the first hour or something. So it sort of depends on what your goals are in terms of when you want to refuel, that sort of thing, or how long you're going to be doing it. Uh, so some of these are just, you know, sort of general snack more you have to when you have insulin levels are higher. And then it, there's nothing wrong with snacking when you do an extended exercise because that's what you would do if you didn't have diabetes. You would you know, be providing a, um, alternate fuels. And um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's important in just a second. So this was, again, just a sort of a guesstimate table that I came up with that show that you know your starting blood glucose level really does have a big make a big effect and if you were uh, way over 200 it might be completely different than that but this is just kind of within a fairly normal range um, and then the duration and both the duration and intensity are going to have an effect on how much you may need to supplement so here's actually one of the few studies we've also seen on this that came out recently that looked at um, based on CGM results, which you remember are lagging about 15 or 20 minutes behind your actual blood glucose level, um, that it's kind of by trending. So if it's, um, you know, if it's low, then it, it, you do this and you know, follow a certain protocol. And if it's trending double down, then it, it's more carbohydrate and so forth. But um, you know, there just haven't been enough studies really looking at at this, and then if you even if you start to do the studies, as Jane will find, tell you, you have to do multiple studies to cover, okay, now I'm doing low intensity for an hour, I'm doing moderate intensity for 45 minutes, I'm doing vigorous for 30 minutes, I'm doing sprint training, I'm doing resistance training, you know, and you'd have to repeat it for all the different types of activities to really have it um, uh, scientifically proven. Uh, so this was one study that came out a while back that looked at just what's the effect of consuming carbs during exercise. And this was just sports drinks. You can see the 8% versus 10%. That's only uh, 2 grams per 100 ml different in terms of carbohydrate. Because that's how you figured out 8% would be 8 grams per 100 milliliters of fluid. <coughs> uh, and it, you can see that it just kept the blood glucose level a little bit higher to be consuming um, more carbs. And so, and it gives you an idea of what their total intake was over that um, p exercise period there, which was an hour. So in one case, they consumed 53, in the other, con they consumed 66.5 grams. And you guys know about treating acute hypos, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I did want to mention, though, the glucagon, because I, I don't think anybody's talked about that yet today, that um, it's not something you want to have to use. <laughs> And how many of you guys have had glucagon injection before? Pleasant? Yeah. 
they have some little mini ones now. Um, and they're also working on making uh, a glucagon that's more shelf stable so that you wouldn't have to buy a new glucagon kit every three months. And um, so uh, that's always just something to keep in mind too is if you've ever had a, a severe litter that you weren't able, able to self-treat, if you had a glucagon pen around that someone could use on you, that uh, that might have saved a trip to the ER or calling 911 or something. Right. Like, for example, if you have a two-year-old, you gave them their insulin, right. and then they're vomiting. and that kind of, So we teach it to families, and then I've used it on myself for lows that I've treated. I'm not coming up, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I'm vomiting, and I'm giving myself 20 units, and it's actually, I don't want to say a pleasant experience, but because it's such a low dose, I'm not getting the nausea and vomiting. So right, yeah, and I think that may be the way, the way that we're going, because it, one of the closed-loop systems I know they're investigating now doesn't just give insulin, it gives insulin and glucagon, and so that gives you a balance, insulin lowering, glucagon raising, the um, blood glucose, so that you, you don't actually have to eat every time, right. um, which would be nice, you know, because every, every calorie you take in counts, even if uh, you're using it to treat a low, it's not like and those calories don't right. count. Yeah. So I just don't understand why, and I don't know, you know, we've been in the health team, why, why is that not something that they're really talking about? Because I think a lot of people think that glucagon is just for an emergency. Make sure your lover or partner or family member got this kit and is going to wake you up in the middle of the night if you're sneezing, and it really is a helpful tool. And so I just don't, you know, it can be a helpful tool. I, I, my guess would be the main reason is that it hasn't been very shelf stable and that you only had the full dose available until now. And um, I mean, I, I'm doing some consulting with one company. I know they've been looking at trying to create glucagon that's almost like a pen that you could use it when you need to. And if you could do that, then it wouldn't be a bad way to bring up a low. Yeah, and it would actually be a really rapid way to bring up a low. Well, right. that is so using it as a post exercise. That, that is true, but in some ways it's not true because glucagon has its main effect on the liver, and the liver maintains the blood glucose. I mean, that's what its job is, and it does it two ways. One is by releasing glycogen, the other is by making new glucose through gluconeogenesis. That process is a little bit slower, and when you have to rely on that during exercise, then you're you're struggling, and you really need to take in some carbs, but. Um, that's actually the main the way that your body makes glucose like first thing in the morning before you've eaten when it's been eight or 12 hours since you last ate you're you're out of most of your liver glycogen so it's not that you can't it's just that it's it's a slightly slower process than if you can just dump the glycogen right out of the liver but as glucose slow maybe I don't think anybody's studied that but it doesn't take that long not if you, you, okay, and the other point I was going to make about the blood glucose is, do you know how much glucose is actually in your entire bloodstream? Like how many grams of glucose that is for a whole body? Five grams. I've got four gram glucose tablets, you know? Five grams is not very much. And if that's all your liver would have to, if your liver would even have to produce just half of that to get you from 50 to 100, that's not much. So where it has trouble keeping us is when you're exercising and your, your use of, of blood glucose is tripled or quadrupled and your liver is out of glycogen, so it's having to produce it from, from scratch and it, that it's hard to keep up with. But it can, it, you've got enough capacity to come out of a low with a glucagon injection just by your liver making the glucose. At least that, that's my opinion. <laughs> There aren't a lot of studies on that either. I just know, I know the mechanism behind that. I, I, I know all those metabolic pathways, so I had to learn. <laughs> all right, so carb loading, that's a good question too. I mean, if you have diabetes, should you carb load? Um, I, I think that most athletes actually overdo the carbs, uh, especially the endurance athletes, thinking that they gotta have this pasta dinner or they're not gonna perform well. Well, interestingly, if you are consuming enough calories on a daily basis, and, and maybe even if you're only consuming about 40% of your calories as carbs, that's enough. 
because you can only restore glycogen at a rate of about 7% per hour. And that's why it can take you 24 to 48 hours to fully restore it. And if you're taking inadequate car carbs, let's say you're an endurance training athlete and you actually consume 4,000 calories a day, even if 40% of that, that's 1,600 calories, that's only 400 grams of carbs over a full day out of 4,000 calories. So you don't actually have to have a, a high carb diet in order to have adequate carbs to replace the glycogen. You just, I mean, the, it is important to make sure you consume some or the process is very slow because then you're basically doing it through gluconeogenesis. And they do have studies where they show people eat a, a, just a high fat diet afterwards versus a, a moderate carb diet or just a high protein. That if you don't have the adequate carbs in your diet, that it slows down the rate at which you're able to replete the glycogen. But I'm, I'm guessing that most of you guys, if you're consuming at least 40% of your calories as carbs, are getting adequate carbs to be able to do that. So the only study I knew that looked at this in, in type 1 athletes, um, they compared can, taking 50% of calories as carbs versus 59%, and they actually did better uh, in terms of restoring the glycogen when they were on the 50% diet, not the 59%, because they had higher blood glucose levels. Well, if your blood glucose is high, it's not getting into your, blood, your uh, muscles, it's in the bloodstream, and then maybe you're peeing it out if your blood sugar goes too high. Um, you need to take more insulin, and then you actually restore less glycogen. I've seen a similar sort of study looking at liver glycogen, that the best way to restore liver glycogen which you have to do every day after an overnight fast, is by um, being in, in moderately good control. So there you go. That's my soapbox. I'll step off it now. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, just, um, I, I wouldn't suggest a, you know, a total paleo diet and expect that you're going to be taking in enough um, carbs if you're doing endurance training. The only person I, I heard talk about that recently uh, said, oh, only do low intensity activity. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's because you don't have any glycogen and that's all you can carry, you can do because you're, you're relying a lot more on fat. Um, but anyway, the delayed onset, I was going to mention that a little bit just because there are a couple studies that looked at this. I already mentioned 24 to 48 hours, but um, more in the range of 6 to 12, or one study showed 7 to 11 hours is when it's most common. And you really have to just work on preventing that, knowing that it's a possibility, and then just taking preventive steps to do that. So it may be always eating something at bedtime, especially if you, go, you know you did a certain activity today and your blood glucose is a certain level when you go to bed, or um, you know, adjusting basal rates, maybe adjusting the amount of insulin you take for uh, post-exercise meals. So this is the one study. You may just look at this one in the corner. Glucose infusion rate that means just during this this trial, they had to in, uh, give people uh, IV glucose at a certain rate to, to treat what would have been hypoglycemia otherwise. So right at the end of exercise, they were most likely to develop a low, and 7 to 11 hours later. So what, what time of day is that for most of you guys, 7 to 11 hours later? Middle of the night? Yeah, yeah I mean, a really inconvenient time to get low after <laughs> you exercised. I think in this study, they did afternoon exercise, and so 7 to 11 hours later is a smack dab in the middle of the night. Um, so y you just got to use uh, some strategies, which I'm going to mention here in just a sec. Here's one. Uh, this was um, uh, immediately post-exercise, um, and then you can see dinner, so it was later in the day. Um, they used, they tried uh, two different sports drinks, water and whole milk and skim milk. And uh, I put the blue lines there because let's say you won't optimally you don't like to go above, you know, say 180, but you don't want to go below 80. So which one of those keeps you in that range? It was the whole milk. Now that's not surprising to me, but apparently the people that did the study, they, they're like, oh wow, you know, look what milk does. But skim milk, because it's, that's what they, you can use to treat a low. It's just the carbs, it's just lactose, which is, quickly broken down into glucose and galactose, and so it can raise blood sugar pretty quickly. And then, uh, obviously, water would be <laughs> the least uh, effective one. The sports drinks, most of them cause the glucose to go too high. I mean, they're made out of glucose polymers, 
So you know, it'll pop your blood glucose up, which you may not need that. And then if you have to adjust for you know, some insulin for that, then you may drop later. So it, I try to take after exercise what I can consume without having to take any insulin whenever possible, at least in that short window of opportunity of 30 minutes to 120 minutes after the activity when the rate of glycogen repletion is fastest. It doesn't mean that you replete all of it then, it just means that the enzymes that help you re restore it are most active during that period. So, the timing, let's see if I can go back up. Then it was, um, you can see the, the, that was probably, it looked like, uh, be after lunch or something. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be as good to prevent well, a short-term like low, but it's, Wait, it's, it's written there because that's like oh, that was when it was, so when yeah. was it, when at was zero. it drawn? It was, at zero. Uh, it was, yeah, it was done uh, oh, right, right, right at the end of the exercise. Uh, yeah. So, interestingly, you know, the, this is all the rage with athletes now. They're going to do this post-recovery, uh, post-exercise recovery drink, and they're doing chocolate milk. I'm like, why didn't you ask me? I mean, ask anybody with type 1. We could have told you this years ago that it works because, and it doesn't even have to be chocolate milk. It can be something that uh, is a balance of carbs and protein and maybe some fat. Because, again, the carbs are metabolized most quickly, and then the protein and then the fat can affect your insulin action after a period of time. So if you're trying to prevent a post-exercise low, chocolate milk actually works really well. But it can be chocolate soy milk, it can be, I like to use yogurt, which is like a fairly low carb yogurt. I don't even take any insulin for it, but it keeps me from dropping until when I get around to eating after that. But the idea is that you take in something that's balanced and not just carbs, or it can even be in that ratio of four to one of four grams carbs to one gram protein, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, I just wouldn't suggest right afterwards taking in something that you think you have to take a lot of insulin for, and then you overshoot the insulin, and, uh, and then you get really low, because you've got the effects of the uh, activity still going on and the effects of the insulin. Um, so one other thing I wanted to talk about is a series of studies that have looked at what also increases hypoglycemia risk in, in people with type 1 diabetes. They've uh, actually found that um, if you have uh, a hypoglycemic reaction earlier in the day or even the day before, that that affects your um, risk for having another hypo or, and, not, and you know, not reacting that well to it. This one showed afternoon hypoglycemia following uh, either prior exercise or prior hypoglycemia. Both of them made your body less able to respond in terms of the hormones that it releases and the glucose that gets released in response to that. So um, there's actually a whole thing that they call, the, it, it's called um, um, hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure, you know, or HOF, <laughs> the medical term, I guess. Um, I actually had a conversation with uh, someone about this this week, who's the um, upcoming president of the ADA for next year. Uh, Dr. DeGogo Jack was visiting uh, Eastern Virginia, Virginia Medical School earlier this week, and I got to talk to him, because he's done some of these similar studies, and so they were looking at what causes you not to be able to respond as well as before. And the answer was, uh, they don't know why. <laughs> Unfortunately, what happens is, um, they looked at all sorts of things. They were thinking, well, it's kind of like if you've released all this adrenaline while you're exercising or you released it because you were low, well, the next time you get low or you exercise, you can't release as much. But it turns out that it's adrenaline is kind of created on a, an ad ne as needed basis. And so you don't ever run out of it. That you wouldn't want to run out of it. That's your flight or uh, fight hormone. And if all of a sudden you'd been exercising and all of a sudden you, and you know, a bear started chasing you and you couldn't get the adrenaline to run away, you know, you'd get eaten. So evolution didn't <laughs> let you go that direction so that you can actually get depleted of your ability to release uh, adrenaline, otherwise known as epinephrine. So that, that didn't explain it. Um, but, you know, this has happened all sorts of different ways. They did it same day, day before, next day. This, this one they actually had 
people do um, two, type, two intensities of exercise the day before, and then they looked at when they had a hypoglycemia, which was laboratory induced, the next day, how did they respond? If you see where I put the arrow, they didn't respond as well. They didn't release as much um, adrenaline if they'd exercised the day before. Now that's bad news for most of us, right? Because almost all of us have exercised the day before. Um, so they, they don't know exactly why this is happening. Um, it just, it, yeah, they're still doing a lot of research to try to figure it out. But uh, this one is next day exercise following varying levels of hypoglycemia um, also affects your ability to produce glucose. I gotta talk faster now. But anyway, I was just trying to get the point across that if you've had a low before or if you've exercised before, your risk of having another low is greater and your risk of not responding as well during the exercise in terms of your hormone release is actually lower as well. And, uh, and once they figure out what, what causes that, hopefully it's reversible. But you know, what you just have to do is be aware of it. And you know you may need less insulin, uh, you know, the especially subsequent days of exercise, your insulin needs may go over, down over the first three days. So I just, this is pretty quick. Um, so checking blood glucose before, uh, during, after, uh, or using a CGM. I, I don't like CGM so much for exercise because they do lag behind. So they're not going to pick up a low. They may help trend in the right direction, but I mean, nothing is works as well as actually pulling out your meter and testing. And um, you know, the good news is that if you've done this certain type of training, uh, you know, and you've done it over and over and over again, after a while, you you at least have some idea of how you're going to respond. If not, being able to predict it almost entirely. Um, so this is a, the where the intensity affects the fuel use. Uh, when you're doing something really pretty easy, the, those, that plasma free fatty acids, FFAs, that's when you're basically using a lot of, of fat. When you do a lower intensity, like your primary fuel when you're resting is, is fat, not carbohydrate, uh, assuming everything's normal otherwise. So standing here talking, I'm just mainly using fat. I'm not using a lot of carbohydrate. But once you start doing any type of activity, your carbohydrate use goes up. And it goes up dramatically to the point where when you get to moderate or higher exercise, the main fuel that you're using is carbohydrate and not fat. And so what happens when you start to run out of carbohydrates is that you cannot maintain that same intensity. And you have to drop back to a lower intensity where you can use a little bit more fat. Uh, and then still the fat use is going to be affected by the, the presence of carbohydrates. So as Dr. Jindal said, you know, the, you, you, the fats burn in a carbohydrate flame. So you always have to have some carbs available. And some of that can be provided if you take in carbs while you're, you know, refuel while you're exercising. But I don't care what those um, cardio machines say where you're in a fat burning range. Or, you know, when, once you get on that machine, you're pretty much in a carbohydrate burning range. So just ignore that. <laughs> that drives you crazy when I look at that. Um, so typically, and also it's affected by how many carbs you have in your muscle when you start. If you're, you're, your glycogen is already low, you're going to be more prone to getting low blood glucose because you may be using a little bit more of your plasma glucose cause just because your carbs are low in your muscle. And as I made the point earlier, it's only five grams. So when you think about, I've got to replace, I'm hypoglycemic, got to replace my blood glucose, unless you've got a lot of insulin or a lot of high insulin action, it's not going to usually take nearly as many carbs as you think to bring it back up into a normal range. Don't empty the refrigerator. Bad idea. <laughs> um, and then this is our usual response. Generally, you get that middle line where you've exercised 30 minutes moderately or whatever. You're going to get some decrease in blood glucose. So I was just pointing that out again. Yeah. Have you done studies on people without um, diabetes to see what their glucose response is to like high intensity efforts? Yes, it goes up. I mean, like, what's the normal range for an athlete without diabetes? Uh, they'll never go above 140 without them releasing insulin to bring it back down. And in fact, they've done studies, and in, in people who are normally insulin sensitive, they can eat whatever they want, and they'll never go above 140. So you can try to do that if you want. <laughs> I tried to do that when I was pregnant, but after you know, I get through all my pregnancies, I'm like, ah, that's too hard. <laughs> but that's the goal when you're pregnant, to never go above 140. 
Uh, also, I mentioned the competitive effects when I was talking about just, you know, the 21 second uh, um, 50 meter swimming event that some of that is because of the intensity, but obviously if it's a competition, sometimes it's because of the adrenaline release that's just related to the competition as well. Um, so whenever you release those, you're going to, blood glucose is less likely to drop. And one of the things that Jane's going to talk about is how you mix up more intense exercise with less intense and use that strategically to make, make sure you don't get low while you're exercising. And uh, you may need extra insulin afterwards to bring it down, but it's always going to be less insulin than you think compared to normal. So again, a lot of things qualify as, as being higher adrenaline releasing. Uh, you know, doing something that's pretty intense, kind of scary sort of thing, um, skydiving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to ask about TJ's point. I've never tried it, but, you know, you, you hear or read that if you're starting to go low or turn low, <coughs> the lower and higher intensity exercise is high intensity for a short burst and things like that. Yeah, and I'm going to defer to Jane. She, she's going to talk about that. I took that out of my talk so she could talk about it, but that does actually work. Depending on how, you know, unless you just gave yourself five units of short-acting insulin, then you're not going to overcome that. But if you're kind of on basal insulin only, yeah, it's a good, good strategy to do that. And then uh, I mentioned duration before, so I'm not going to spend too much extra time on this. But um, the, the glycogen depletion, if you've been doing it for a long period of time and your glycogen levels are getting lower, it's y the carbohydrate has to come from somewhere. And then, then that's when you really can use more of glucose from an outside source to help maintain blood glucose. And then your body will take up more of it. Uh, and I was going to talk about the different types, and Jane's going to go into that too. But um, There is a definitely a metabolic difference, and since I'm running out of time, I'm going to let her talk about that uh, entirely. But um, one other thing just to mention is that, again, you can use this strategically. It's not always bad that say doing something more intense will raise your blood glucose. I mean, I'll do that sometimes when I get near the end of an hour swim and I realize I'm getting low. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to sprint um, the next two laps so that I can finish my workout without having to get out of the pool. And uh, generally it works because I'm, I don't have that high of insulin when I'm doing it. And then one other thing is the increased muscle mass that you may get from doing um, certain types of training, generally, um, you know, like sprint training or resistance training, that sort of thing, Overall, that's going to probably reduce your insulin needs because um, a lot of your insulin sensitivity ha intensity has to do with your carbohydrate stores. If you sit around all day and you never use any muscle glycogen, you are not going to be very insulin res uh, sensitive because when you eat more carbs, they can't go into storage in your muscle, and that's the primary place you store them. I mean, it's like the tank's full. Where do you think it's going to go? Well, then it goes to the liver, and it gets converted into fat, and it goes into fat storage because you almost have an, an endless supply of fat cells in you know, uh, uh, unlimited capacity to store fat. And that's, that's the problem um, if you're just consuming carbs and not exercising. But um, if you continue to exercise, you'll always be somewhat insulin resist uh, sensitive because you've used up some of that tank of carbohydrates and now you get to fill it back up. Uh, also timing, I was just going to mention this because a lot of you guys were out exercising this morning. You may have a different response to your exercise before breakfast and insulin compared to later in the day. And there have been a, a few studies I've looked at this and generally doing the same activity after breakfast causes a greater drop in blood glucose than doing it before. So. A lot of people have told me, you know, I go out and exercise in the morning and I start out normal and I come back and I'm like, 180, what happened? I'm like, well, you didn't break your fast. So you need to eat a little bit of something, take a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of insulin. It doesn't have to be very much. And that will fix it every time. It's same thing with type 2s. I've had so many of them tell me they didn't like to exercise in the morning because it makes their glucose go up. I said, eat something first, then you're good because, you know, they can still release their own insulin. So they think I'm a miracle worker. <laughs> Just break that fast. Um, this was one study I did a while ago, back. It, it was just in type 2, but it showed um, an interesting phenomenon of the effects of doing exercise either right before you eat or right after you eat. And uh, when you did it right after, it actually prevented that postprandial spike. Because you've got those two mechanisms going then. You've got the insulin and you've got the contractions both taking up glucose. It also slows down the absorption of the food and how fast you can digest it. It's just an idea to keep in mind if, you, you know, you, if you're high and you want to eat, give the insulin, eat, and go exercise. That works pretty well. 
And then I just wanted to mention also the training effect because even though you think you've got it all figured out, you know, you get three or four weeks out in your same training and all of a sudden you're not responding the same way as you were before. You may need fewer carbs and or your blood glucose is not changing as much as it did before. That's normal. That happens in everybody. You just have to be smarter than the average person and you have to realize why that's happening. Um, and it's because it, once you train, you've actually increased your aerobic capacity. Uh, well, we're talking mainly about aerobic training. Um, so let's say you, you run a, a 10 minute mile and then after it's four weeks of training, when you run a 10 minute mile, it's actually a lower percentage of your total now, of your total capacity. And you're able to use a higher percentage of fat and a lower percentage of carbohydrate. And that actually makes you use fewer carbs. The only way to keep it the same is you go back up to that same relative intensity, let's say, your 10 minute mile was at 70% of your capacity, but after training, it's only at 65, but you increase your pace, and so now you're still at 70%, then your carb use is exactly the same. But it has to be the same relative intensity, which may be a higher absolute intensity, if that makes sense. And it's also training, training is very specific to the activity. If you've been swimming and you try running, running is a new activity. So all bets are off for that one. And then just a short list of some of the other things. I've mentioned some of these already, but being hyperglycemic makes you insulin resistant, and it takes a while to come down from that sometimes. Um, it, it does affect insulin action. And for women, they have to worry about where they are in terms of the cycle. And then as we saw this morning, um, some environmental extremes. Uh, I, I actually did study, I was involved in a study that did some studies at, at Pikes Peak in Colorado, and that, that increased blood glucose turnover and blood glucose use. But it doesn't mean always you, you're going to get low. Sometimes it makes you insulin resistant. So you're not quite sure how you're going to respond. But you do know that any type of environmental extreme is going to increase carbohydrate use because it's a stressor on the body. So it, it, you respond like a physical or mental stressor. So I guess this is my final say. <laughs> uh, so I've covered all these. Staying kind of in control, you want to do it. Try to avoid or minimize hypoglycemia, both during and after. Um, Got to balance carbohydrate intake, both during and then afterwards also restore glycogen. A lot of times you will need lower insulin doses. And this is the book I mentioned that uh, actually has a, a, over 100 different sports and activities. It does have skydiving in there um, and scuba. I think I don't have I don't have car racing in there though. I'm not like I didn't know Charlie Kimball when I was redoing this book. So, and then uh, just to mention, this is not for most of you guys, but this is a professional book that just came out um, last month that I did for the American Diabetes Association that's aimed more at the professional who prescribes exercise and it, it covers everything, but um, type one, type two, all the diabetic complications and stuff. But it's written like um, a bunch of review articles written for journals. So. It's, kind of boring, other than the case studies in there, which are pretty good. But I would suggest if you guys need some help, get the, the first book, not the second one. And that's it. Do you guys?